Hello everyone, welcome to Tray's Gaff once more. It's a new improved gaff now because she's got new doors and windows in. Uh, is it doors, plural or doors? Oh yes, doors and windows. Yep, so it's looking good now. Um, I'm sure she'll post some pictures at some point which you can get round to it to let you see. But today uh, we're going to be looking at the journey of an individual who you can use the, 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 the terms of complex needs if you want to, but it's it's individual Nigel who's part of the uh, charity and he throughout his life up to the present day now has had problems with learning barriers, learning difficulties, dyslexia, dyscalculia, all the rest of it and he's had a, uh, an up and down kind of journey and I just thought it was important that we highlighted to people um, how difficult a journey can be but also how positive it can also be um, and look at the ways that Nigel has coped throughout his life. Now, I'm using the, the term milestone because we're going to be looking at different parts of Nigel's life from early on to where he's at now. And hopefully that will give people on Nigel's Facebook page a really good in-depth view of how it really is for someone living with complex needs. Because I don't think, and I've said this for many years, I've been involved with, uh, with people such as Nigel for many years as well, really people partly don't want to know but also really can't be asked to know mm. so you get a bit of a service and that's about it really then you left to flounder or you're banged off to live independently without the right support uh, so anyway we're going to start with the first milestone for nigel which is ian side school is that right nigel yeah it was yeah which is a school or was a school was in a peter school. moore it's no yeah. longer there now, is that right? Ah, it's been knocked down, yeah. It's been knocked down, so Nigel can't go now, which is a shame, really, because he turned up quite a few times, there was no school there. <laughs> <laughs> Where's it gone? I can understand with lockdowns where people are bad from going to school, but knocking it down, that's going a bit too far, I think. <laughs> anyway, right, I digress. So, knocking it down. the reason why we're looking at the inside school is because Nigel spent time there, and I think if I remember now, as you mentioned about you were given support with particular learning, weren't you in that school? Yeah. Yeah? So can we start with that milestone? Do you know roughly how old you were there when you started going to the inside school? Approximately. No, nobody's going to come on and say, ah, he was older than that. Ten. Ten? Yeah. Yeah? I remember when I was ten. I don't. It's a vague really? recollection of ten. <laughs> well, because it was... September, mm. I started, started. Some, well, some of us were in the class, there was about me about seven of us who were ten at the time. But because our birthdays were in October. Ah, yes, yeah, so you started before the, yeah. Uh, and so we were. September intake. Aye. Uh, yeah. So, you, you've gone to the inside school. Before you went to inside school, were you aware you were struggling with things like money and writing and reading and things like that? Were you aware of it? Maybe, maybe just a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's not, not uh, fully. No. Which areas did you struggle on that you can recall? Because I know we've gone back to ten now, and you're now fifty. Was it two? Fifty-two. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, if I was asked the question back when I was ten, I think I'd probably struggle a bit. So do yeah. your best. What kind of areas do you think? Um, you know, did you go to the shop and struggle with money? Did you struggle to read newspapers or books or whatever? I sometimes struggle to read books and stuff like that and struggle with money and cotton money and that. And can you think of an experience that, that uh, took place that, that maybe wasn't necessarily comfortable when that took place? Say for instance you went to the shop to buy something and the shopkeeper's behind the counter, you're asked to provide X amount of pounds or whatever or pence for, for the item you bought. Was there a time when that became uncomfortable, when you couldn't actually work it out? Yeah, it was uncomfortable, yeah. And how did it make you feel? How did you handle it? Uh, well, I got a bit... Uh, embarrassed, shamed? A little, a little embarrassed, yeah. Because I was all, all, all up the queue and that. And, you know, because that's a classic in, you know, people with dyslexia or, or uh, learned disability or whatever. If, you, if you're not able to, to uh, respond in kind to a request for an amount, because you don't know how to work that amount out, 
you're more aware of the people that perhaps are going to say something, do something, whatever, yeah. than you are actually doing the transaction. Now, obviously, in that situation there, it's down to the shopkeeper to be empathic and work with you to help you. And that's not always going to be the case. Because what used to be said was, oh, we'll just ask the person in the shop to help you. It doesn't always work. No. And they haven't got time because they've got loads of people behind them. So what did you do then, Nigel? Found run out of the shop. <laughs> I don't want it! <laughs> what did you do? Just bought it and went. I just went back to school. Did, did you do a classic? Because this is what Mark used to do, right? He would just get his hand in his pocket and just plonk the money on the counter, right? And expect the shopkeeper to count out the money. Did you uh, do that? Uh, well, I just got some coins, just, give it, just let them... I didn't plonk it on the counter, but I just gave some, some change in my hand. What risks are there around that when people are doing that that can't handle money? Uh, people taking it. Yeah, yeah you, taking it. Because you don't always know if that person's going to give you the right yeah. change back. No. And no, it might take more and you don't know that. Exactly. Now that is an area that we used to work on quite a lot in, in schools and, and colleges, but it was always done with, with false money and it was never in context. No. So for instance, say that you struggled, as you said, Nigel, with the shop transaction. I pushed to get it put into what used to be called contextualised learning. Yeah. So go into the shop with Nigel and work in that shop. And even if it's a local community where you regularly go, make the shopkeeper aware that you struggle with money. So if you go in again, yeah. that person is more than likely to be able to, to assist you. Yeah? yeah? Unfortunately, it didn't really change. And people were told, well, well, just go in the shop and, you know, it'll be fine. Uh, just hand them the money. And, of course, people were getting ripped off. Not everybody ripped them off, but people were yeah. getting ripped off. And he didn't really achieve anything. No. Because if they got outside their own community where people didn't know them, totally different ball Yeah, they still got the same problems. Yeah, and the more times that happens, <laughs> Nigel, and I'm sure it happened quite a number of times with you, what, what, what could it potentially do to an individual? What, what, how could it affect them? What could it affect? I don't know how you feel. Did you feel different? Different, yeah. <laughs> Going to Gary. So, w when you feel different, did you mean you feel different from the people that were in the shop with you? Were there many people in the shop that day? Not, not, not really, no. But enough to make you feel uncomfortable? Yeah. Yeah. So, People would feel different. Yeah. Because they probably, or if somebody had been in front of you, they're probably doing their transaction quite quickly, come out the shop and then you're next and it goes wrong. You know, so that's not anything that's good for your confidence and self esteem. No. And if your time's up by X amount of years, and we are talking about milestones here, yeah. right, with no support, it's going to get worse. Yeah? And a lot of people, including Gary, a lot of people would actually go in shops, do that and run out because they were frightened. Yeah. Okay, partly with, with guys, it was more like fun as well. <laughs> um, they used to do what I called a reverse burglary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you'd run in with, a, with a, a, a blank DVD and then slam it on the counter and run out <laughs> with the shopkeeper near them anywhere. So that milestone now is so the very early part of your school life and you know we've got to look at your infancy uh, at some point and on. Tell me a little bit about being in class with that learning barrier. You struggled a little bit with the reading, you mentioned that, and you struggled a little bit with your, with your money as well, you mentioned that. Yeah. Now, you probably wouldn't be using money in class, but you would be having to look at a blackboard, you'd have yeah. to be writing things down, and you know, you know you've got dyslexia. Yeah. Yeah, it took quite a number of years to find that out, but you, you now know that's why you couldn't get that message across. No. And you know you are you are and you have been more than able because we've done a lot of work together to articulate what you mean through the spoken word. Yeah, yeah, I've heard. And I that's have. been a massive support yeah. for Nigel. And unfortunately, everybody has to fit into the literacy box. And if you don't fit the literacy box, guess where you get sent? Hmm? Where do you think you get sent to? All skills had them, and all colleges had them as well. You got shipped off to where? No, well, I know where I got shifted off to, because I had a disability at school as well. Yeah. It was the um, 
We'll ask you again in a minute, Tre, yeah. about that. Did they have a special educational area or yeah. special educational teachers or a unit where you could go to to get assistance yeah, yeah. with the yeah. yeah, in a different block, uh, a different section, wasn't different class. Yeah. Now, where is the problem with that? If we're looking at someone's confidence, self-esteem, future abilities, what 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 is the major? And I fought this for years in colleges and schools. I hated it. What happens to that individual as soon as they're sent off to that unit? All your classmates are in learning. Mm -hmm. You don't spend time with them, you go off to somewhere else. Yeah. What do your classmates think? What are they thinking? You always got to get these ones who are going to stigmatise people. Different. Huh? You're different. Yeah, different, yeah. And from that comes the kinds of words that we've all been used to. Yeah? Yeah. One major one is, oh, you thick you. Oh, thick you, you're off to your special needs class. I've heard all that before. In fact, I'll tell you a little story now before we carry on. <laughs> Although this is not a story. <clears throat> Jennifer, lovely Jennifer. <laughs> right, at college, someone made a massive mistake, right, she said she was going along to the class, which is for people with learning disabilities, and this individual decided to, to say something to her. And within seconds, that person was on the floor. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to wait, yeah. And no, where normally I would assist, <laughs> you know, flat leg. Like, <laughs> moved on. <laughs> Just knock him out. <laughs> yeah, never got up anywhere. <laughs> um, we had to call for assistance. So. Moving quickly along, uh, if Jennifer hears that, you'll probably remember because there's many things like that as well. Yeah. You do become different and people will stigmatise you, they will criticise you because you're not keeping up with everybody else. And even teachers in their uh, language would use things, oh, keep up Brannigan, yeah? Keep up Geldad, what's up with you? Now, in a class full of people, you're not going to say, well, actually, <laughs> I'm the only one. <laughs> doesn't get this shit. <laughs> <laughs> people won't do it because they'll just try to try to, you know, get on and, and just hope that people don't don't notice. Some schools now they've got people in who can, you know, work with people with dyslexia, things like that, but they still section them off. Yeah. Or they yeah. sit with them, which I think is more stigmatic than actually taking them off somewhere else. Yeah. Because it's almost like putting a Belisha beacon on someone's head in the class. Oh look, that's the one that's getting help. Because <laughs> that's the one that stick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so again, Nigel, tell me a little bit about the school life and how you think that you learn difficulty, disability, whatever, affected you in that everyday school life. What was different about it? What, what things do you remember that, that... What did you end up doing to try to override that? To try to make it different and help? What happened if you were behind in, in the class, for instance, and you weren't picking things up off the blackboard or you'd written something down wrong? Do you remember anything like that at all in your school life? I, I did make mistakes sometimes, yeah. Um, and what, what, what took place when you made the mistakes? Was this actually in the mainstream class or in your actual uh, special educational class? Um, in the unit thing, in the yeah. unit part. So it was a unit in the school, because I think I've got a very yeah, well, collection of it. it was, well, it was in the same grounds, yeah? Because the main school was, um, the unit bit was on separate. So did you, did you go to it, actually leave the school, then go across the unit, or did, was it all joined together? No, it wasn't joined together, no. It's so you had to back the journey from school into the, into the unit? No, we could, you'd go different ways. There was... Did you go straight to the unit from home? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You could, it was just a, a separate th thing. So how, building. how long was it before you actually got taken out of mainstream class and put into the unit? Do you remember? Well, from the start, basically. From the start? Yeah. So did that come from an assessment? of your learning abilities at that time? I don't know, I don't think Cause so. Because I think he's, I've got a vague recollection, I'm sure I knew some people from there, it was a lot of years ago now, 
they, they were quite ahead of the game in relation to special education. So maybe you were lucky that you were put there early on. Yeah. And I think they probably have done some kind of assessment early on to, to get you into there. So I think maybe you were quite lucky, really. Yeah. Because a lot of people tend not to, you know, well, you, you had experience yourself, yeah. Trey. Do you mind if Trey mentions what her experience was as well? She does, you know, it's in line with you because she's got dyslexia. I do mind that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all. <laughs> I'll take your pies over. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will. Let's have three, Nigel. Yeah, I'll have three pies, yeah. So, Trey, go on then. You, you uh, clearly have, 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 you know, been um, through a, a long process of education where you've had a learning difficulty barrier, whatever we want yeah. to call it. And that, that in itself is called dyslexia. Yeah? Yeah. How did that affect you in your school life? And we'll come back to Nadia in a moment. Well, I didn't know I had dyslexia until you told me. I don't think that oh, was... But Trey, don't believe me. <laughs> I, I, you were I just thick. didn't know I was dyslexic till you told me. So I'd gone through all my schooling, all my colleging and my uh, degree without realising I had dyslexia. Nobody picked that up. But mine was something slightly more um, physical as I couldn't hear probably, properly. Sorry? <laughs> and my mum, because I had to go to the hospital, my mum told the school that I couldn't hear properly. And all I did at first was put me in the front of the class. This was a junior school. <laughs> and I had to try and pick up what was going on by sight. Um, and then eventually I was put into a special class, um, partly, some of the time, which was in Ju uh, Victoria Junior School. It was just another classroom where people who were having difficulties sort of like went in. Um, so I, I did partly in there and partly in the main classes, but it was just a nightmare. I went through all of my junior school year like that. Uh, I can't remember what infant school was like. I don't remember being able to cope there either. And when I got to senior school, there was no special section. So again, I just had to cope the best I could in the classes. Um, and by the time I was 12, I think I had my last operation on my ears and I was able to hear a bit better. So I did better in school. But um, one of the things I do remember was with my maths, and me English, maths, I was always in detention because I couldn't do it. I just couldn't understand it. And with the English, they used to rip my um, stuff up in class because of the fact I couldn't spell properly. And that was great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, so on the spelling side, which which is a classic really in school, isn't it? You know, you, you learn by rote with, you, with your times tables and things like that. Yeah. And again, this is always a, a contentious issue for me because not every child learns the same way. You can't blanket education. It doesn't, doesn't work. You're always going to have problems. People will learn in the way that they actually believe is best for them. Yeah. If you allow them. Unfortunately, the school, the mainstream school system doesn't actually cater for that, unfortunately. Um, I think it was a chap called Dark who developed learning styles, you know, where people learnt in different ways, whether it be visual or, or audio or whatever. Um, and they kind of sneaked that in a little bit just to help him. He didn't really kind of, because it was far too complex and, and complicated. Yeah. And teachers had loads of other people to teach and they had to get the lessons out. So they didn't have time to spend with individuals. We've now got, I'm saying we, I'm not talking collectively, but when I was working, there were now what's called learned assistants, where they would go into the class with a, mm -hmm. a child. And, you know, it is quite stigmatic. I'm not, not against that, but it, it's not really a good way for someone to learn, really. You know, it, it's, I mean, I, I would have preferred if it was tutored as in a one-to-one, -one, you know. And OK, it's away from the classroom, but it could be supplemental to the, to the classwork as well, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but again, if you're looking to reorganise the school system to cater for people with special educational needs, then, you, you, you know, you're really just in the wind. It's not going to work. Uh, and, and they've tried for years. I'm not being overly cynical. I've seen it happen. And many people like Nigel and yourself have fallen through the net. But on a, on a more positive note, what you'll probably find is, and you two are an example of this, from that kind of problem, if you want to use the word problem, people find a strength, in the strength to survive. Now, it's been proven as well 
that people with things like dyslexia become almost more clever than a lot of other people in the same peer group. And that, that desire to succeed because of that barrier, it gives you that power to, to push on. Now, you, you two are prime examples now, so you've managed to get through life and you know, you've done well in many ways. You've helped a lot of people as well, but you've also done things that a lot of people in your peer group couldn't do. But you've done it through a way because you've found a way. Now, you've got different ways, and it might be because of your autism as well, of working things out, haven't you? Yeah. Now, was that taught to you by school or something you devised to help you? Well, you know, divide. Oh. And did you find you had to do that because the other way didn't fit in with you? No. And that's the same with you? Yeah. Because you would never have got to degree level with your dyslexia, especially the absence of knowing you had dyslexia as well. Yeah, yeah. Had you not had that desire to succeed and push on? Well, when I left school, because I didn't do very well at school, um, I couldn't get into college. I ended up, I mean, I got work and then I, I, I did night classes and I asked through for years because I always needed something to get the next job or do better at work. And um, I think I found ways to learn in a way that other people wondered how I did it. Um, because at work especially, it stood out. I found that I, I was being asked to do things that was beyond my job description for other people because I was able to work things out in a logical way. I mean, I could map things out. And that is because I had to learn my own way. Yeah, there's a lot of people with uh, dyslexia that uh, um, have done really well in life. I think Branson's one. Uh, I think uh, the computer chap, he also had dyslexia. I forgot his name now. Made a fortune. Jobs, Steve yeah. Jobs. He also had dyslexia. He didn't know until he got into his teenage years that there was something wrong. Yeah. But that was one bright individual. And you'll find, I think Rita Tushigam, she was also dyslexic. Uh, There's quite a number of people who succeeded. And you don't have to become a, a celebrity to actually succeed. But to get through life is a, is a big success. Now, in another podcast, we're going to come back to that, about how people with learning difficulties, learning barriers, actually survive and the things they're put in place to get through. Now, if we go back, thanks to if we go back to your shop situation, as we, where the money situation was a problem, how did you get over that? Did you ever get over it? Did you put something in place whereby it helped you? What did you do? Because you couldn't not go shopping because you couldn't cope with the money side. What did you do? Just put something in place so I could manage, yeah. And what did you put in place? I mean, I know the answer to that question, but, but I want you to tell the, the listeners. How did you get over it? What, what things did you do to help you? I just stuck the right money and made sure that I had the right change on me and stuff. Got so, stuff so how did you know you had the right money back home then? Because I, I see how much I had me in me wallet and stuff. Right. So, so if you if you weren't so good at handling money, how did you know you how much you had in your wallet? Was it through recognition of coins or notes or whatever? How did you do it? Not just the, out no, knowing what, well, seeing what notes I had and stuff and what coins I had before I went to shop. And this wasn't something you did where, and I always remember this, because they used to get the bloody boxes out with, with paper money in and bloody plastic coins. You remember them, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, as if that was ever going to, you know, <laughs> solve anything. But you've done it through real contextualised learning. Yeah. You've looked at the actual money because you knew that was going to go into the shop. Yeah. And it was trying to get over that barrier that you had when, when it didn't work with the transaction. Yeah. Yeah? That's something we'll come back to again, because I think that, again, is crucial. A lot of yeah. people with autism, you'd be surprised, people don't always see this. They have some real wild and wonderful and weird ways of getting from there to there that you don't often see. But if you can get from there to there, whichever way you do it, that's sure is success. But if you're told that's wrong, oh no, you don't do it that way, this is how you work it out. Remember the early maths? The early, yeah. Yeah? yeah. I know people who can work out multiplication and division in a totally different way. My son's one, yeah? Like, how did you get there? But it works for him. When when he was a, a, an apprentice at uh, Gen 2, <coughs> I used to get numerous phone calls from the um, 
what they're called now, the, the Gen 2 tutors. So, you know, could you come Mr. Bang? Because we, we're struggling here, you know, your son's very bright, but we can't quite work out, you know, how he's getting uh, these answers to these questions, because we are trained engineers, but we can't work it out, you know, could you come in and just have a bit of a chat? So I went in, and I remember looking at this <laughs> diagram, <laughs> and the engineer said, well, right, this is what we've given them, and this is where we want them to get to, right, to, to, to build something or whatever, and this is what he's presented. Now, we can't work this out, but it's got to where we want to go to. <laughs> but we can't transfer it to this. I said, right, OK. I said, well, actually, my son from very early on displayed signs of autism. He displayed signs of dyslexia as well. In school, he had a bit of a struggle as well. He's found ways of, of doing it through different ways of uh, producing the actual calculations. Yeah. Right. He said... Light bulb moment. <laughs> yeah. Right, you two. We're now going to look at Brannigan in a different way. He's going to tell us how he learns so we can learn from him. Yeah. And I remember uh, the day I come out, it was sunny and I walked on the town. I thought, fucking hell, that's weird. I've just sat with three engineers there and my son was giving them a, a correct answer to a, a question. I just looked like fucking Dead Sea Scrolls to me. <laughs> and I'm now change the way they look at that. And I always remember because I got an email from, I forgot his name now, he's, he's, he's dead now, God love him, probably because I went in. <laughs> and, you know, it said, it, it thanked us because that's actually opened their minds up to other bright students coming in who probably have got dyslexia or they've got, yeah. um, uh, what's it called? Autism. Yeah, uh, dyscalculia. Yeah. Because there's engineering, you know, you might be very clever, but you maybe can't work off their drawings and things like that. Yeah, because they have... For certain formats. Oh, yeah. I found the same thing with finance. Um, I was crap at maths. I'm not brilliant with maths. But finance, I got me head around finance. Even though I did the, the, the theory side, I got round it because, to me, it was just a manipulation of numbers. It's just, well, that goes there and that goes there because it's a type of cost. You know, you code it, and that's how I got round it. And it wasn't dictated to you, it was actually something that you took the initiative to actually... Yeah, because I couldn't understand, I found it difficult to understand the... Because I had to have certain qualifications to do the finance, and the O-level I did, well, GCSE and the A-level. And, and I looked at it and I thought, right, I'm struggling here. Because it's all like, it's all manual double entry stuff, and you think, oh... But then I had to think about, what what is it I'm actually doing? And I, I actually uh, set up my own business on a computer in my own house. And I set it up as if it was a house thing and a business. And I worked it out that way. Because, like, okay, what am I doing? And that was the only way to do it. Yeah, I think, I think we'll, we'll, we'll uh, harness that in another podcast. And it's really important that how... Because it's something I always wanted to do. I wanted to create a situation where people could, could empower other people yeah. and show them how they learnt. Rather than, you know, get a load of people with special needs and you tell them how to, to do something. Oh, this is how you learn to read. This is how you learn to, to write. Or, you know, this is how you learn to work with numbers. Um, so we'll come back to, to that. But we'll, we'll round off because we're getting probably over time now uh, with Nigel. We'll go back to the school environment, Nigel. Yeah. We'll come back to the other stuff on a separate uh, podcast because it's really important, I think, that. So, school, right? The special unit, if that's what it was called, the special unit, was it? Yeah, you just a unit, I think, yeah. So, unit, yeah. so you had people in there with you who were also struggling yeah, they were, yeah. at school. How did you all get on? Okay, we had friends on there. Did you mess about much in Sometimes. class? Sometimes. What was your concentration levels like in that uh, unit? Not very good. Went out the window sometimes. Well, why do you think that would be? Because of the disruption, uh, because everybody's got the same problem. I remember that the same thing. It was chaos. I didn't learn anything in those classes. No. How many teachers did you have in the unit with you and Was it just the one? Well, there was quite, quite a few. In, so. Was anybody in with like behavioural problems or things like that? People that kicked off or were a bit aggressive? Anybody like that in, in the session? Well, there was some, some times. There were a couple of them, yeah. Just maybe kicked off in that. And of course that's not really a good 
situation yeah. to learn in, you know, because you're going to be affected that way. And of course, a lot of disruption quite often occurs because people don't feel as though they're being supported or they're not being attended to or they don't feel comfortable in there. You know, I mean, the fact that you're not in your class with your classmates and you're in this room with people with all kinds of different problems, it's not really a good place to be. You know, and, and I've always been against that. It's just, this it doesn't work. There used to be a unit up at, um, is it Lily Hall? No, what I mean, where the old, uh, where the big roundabout is now. There was, um, see where the ambulance station is? There used to be a school there. Yeah, I think there, there was, for yeah. For people with uh, challenge of behaviour and stuff like that. And on a regular basis, you know, you, you, you could see it just wasn't wasn't working, you know. I mean, it was hard work with the teachers in there as well and the, the, the staff, you know. And it was supposed to be giving them a chance to, to learn in a certain way that would yeah. help them, you know. And it, I mean, there's very little now anyway for people. It's, it's a lot of people have been put into care and things like that, you know, into children's homes or, and things. I could go on, but I, but I won't. So, obviously. Um, there's nobody there, by the way. I'm just... That's, that's the person there that is, <laughs> I refer to them every so often. Um, a bit like Joe Biden on the stage uh, the other day there. Yeah. <laughs> President of the United States, I'm not quite sure if he knows where he's at, God love him. Uh, better than Trump, as you said this yeah. morning, Nigel. But, better than uh, Trump, though. Yeah. So, right, do you think, this is the final question, do you think you made any progress in your unit? And if you did, what, what was that progress that you made? I think it, yeah, made a bit of progress, but so there's the, still, there's still some, Okay, yeah. so you, what, what things did you do? Did you do literacy, like reading, uh, spelling, things like that? Yeah, and maths and stuff like that. Yeah, so tell me a bit about your spelling. Yeah, it in was the okay, class, in the unit, should I say. It was okay, but I still, and spell properly. Right, and what, what was done for you in relation to that uh, spelling problem? Well, was something was written down and then just copied it underneath. It doesn't work with dyslexia, does it? Cause no. It's, it's, there's a... Yeah, you can't say it properly. No. <laughs> I mean, there are certain things in place now where we, they were coming in when I was towards the end of the uh, college, well, annexed college career. Um, different kinds of resources that would help people with dyslexia but it really at the end of the day you've got to empower the individual to, to, to create their way of learning you can't yeah. give it to them it doesn't work that way um, although I was told differently but hey um, so your spelling if you got it wrong obviously you were told it was wrong right by the teacher or the teachers whichever the, the amount was in the, in the class at that time yeah each time you got it wrong because of your dyslexia, clearly, which you didn't find out until years after when I got involved with you. No. How did you feel when you kept getting it wrong? A bit disappointed, yeah. Disappointed, no. Did you get annoyed? Did you get angry when you couldn't get it right? Was the days when you thought, I've had enough of this? Yeah. I've had enough, I've got a bit of a frustrated eye. Committee. And from that comes disruption, from that comes bad behaviour, and I could go on, but that's, that's, that's what happens quite often in those situations. So, the next milestone, which is ready for the next podcast, you left school, or you left the unit. Yeah. How old were you? 16. 16, I remember that as well, Nigel. Yeah, I had a picture once when I was 16, <laughs> with one of them horrible jumpers at that time, uh, which would be in 1970, I think, when I was 16, is that about right? And you looked like a Bay City Roller. Uh, no, 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 it was a different one. <laughs> we, we were doing a 24 hour uh, charity uh, dance uh, at the youth centre in Cockermouth, which you pass on the old back road. It's on still, so it used to be anyway, on the left, you know where Cockermouth School is? Yeah. Um, and I, I had a Herman's uh, Hermit's haircut, down about here, and my hair was kind of fair then, it was more kind of blondy coloured. And I actually looked like him off Scooby Doo. <laughs> <laughs> what was he called? The, the, you know, the thin chap with... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there was this picture taken of me and two other people <laughs> allegedly dancing at this 24-hour... Uh, uh, yeah. It was, it was marvellous. <laughs> um, but anyway... Sorry, Nigel, I've, I've digressed again. 16. 
Yeah. You left school. Where were you heading? You left school. Did you know? No. So what happened then? Was your dad still alive then? Yeah. Yeah? And your mum? Yeah. Well, obviously your mum's still alive anyway. Yeah. Unless she's died since and nobody's told you. <laughs> um, what was done for you then? What help did you get? No, just went on, on my own thing. So what did you do? You left school, you did all the things that people do when they leave school, though you, you left the unit rather than the school. Although the unit was part of school anyway, wasn't it? Um, what were you thinking you were going to do? Because obviously work would be the uh, the thing that everybody was looking at, careers and all the rest of it. Did a lot of your peer group go off and do stuff like that? Yeah. And then you were left? How'd that make you feel? Down, down yeah. And did, could you talk to anybody? Could you talk to your mum and dad? Or did they suggest anything? Or No. So did you sign on? Did you have to sign on? Yeah, that's it's some... Some money in, yeah, coming in, so. And that was your, what was it called then? Uh, uh, unemployment benefit, was it, I think, yeah, at that so. time? I think so, yeah. Because uh, I worked for a while in that area. Uh, that's another milestone for you as well, nice, no, because me, me and you have a vivid memory of sitting in the uh, the job centre, was it, or the, where were we at? Uh, with the computer, and I asked for a different person. Yeah. Because you were struggling, they, they were trying to force you to look for... It's six jobs uh, a yeah, day, way, you yeah. know, and, and really there was no jobs that Naz could match up to because of yeah. his background, but they weren't actually taking care of that. No. So we'll do a, a, again, that'll be another major milestone for you because that did cause a lot of problems for you, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, because you were being told that you had to fit into these jobs, but you, they weren't working on the kinds of things you were struggling with, which is what you struggled at school with, didn't you? Yeah, I did. So of course you had a double did. whammy there, didn't you? And then, of course, another milestone is going to be some of the courses you were put on to. Can you remember any, Nigel? <laughs> can you remember, I do, I do, I do can you remember a more recent one that was down Grey Street in Workington? Oh, that one, I right. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you remember uh, what took place with that one and got you off the, the course? Because clearly it wasn't uh, working for you. Uh, didn't I ask for something? Do yeah, you remember? I think you did, I can't remember. Uh, something to do with the work that we're giving you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think he produced something for me. I looked and thought, what is going on here? Because what it was supposed to do was to, to look at Nigel's barriers. This is what I believed was going yeah. to happen. And this is what it was actually set up to do. But it wasn't for that at all. It was just to get all these people stuck in a bloody room and start cabbing about and kicking off or whatever while they got the big pay packets. And I confronted the uh, the tutor, didn't I? The person who was running the, uh, the club. Yeah. Uh, and Nigel left, I think it was the following day, was it? Or the, uh, or the Because <laughs> they took umbrage with what I was telling them. Uh, I said, do you realise that the work you're giving Nigel isn't actually something that he's going to be able to uh, to achieve? I said, tell me what your rhyme and reason is, where you're taking them to. Oh, no, drop that manner with me, uh, Mr Brannigan. Uh, uh, we, we're trying to help people to get into work. I said, I've worked in education for years, and in unemployment areas as well. I said, sorry, your course ain't working, it's coming off. It was the following day, the day after you came off, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, what was it, work for all or something? I worked for uh, There was many like that, wasn't there? There was, yeah. Um, we were just banging people on and it wasn't solving anything, sadly. Um, but anyway, anything you want to mention before we round off before lunch? Anything that, that's come up through this discussion that, that's, that's rung true with you? Either one of you. Well, it just reminded me a wee bit of what it was like, the difficulties I had when going through school and um, how disappointed I was when I left school. Nigel mentioned really well. disappointment, didn't you, Nigel? Uh, did yeah, you know? oh yeah, definitely. Especially because I couldn't go to college to do the course I wanted to do, so... But early on, disappointment's not a good thing, is it? It's, it's no. a horrible thing. Well, I had to change... I had to change what I planned at 16. I, I went in a completely different direction. I, uh, I ended up in finance and IT, whereas I wanted to be a, a veterinary nurse. <laughs> I don't. I mean, you couldn't get any further away from that, could you? Um, well, not really, true. <laughs> unless you got a bus. And that was just because of my maths. I could do the sciences. It was the maths that let me down. Um, yeah, it can be a big uh, blow. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Would you want to be an asshole when you when you grew up? I wanted to be taller than I, I got taller. Well, I, 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 I think I was 
uh, to learn to drive and that and get driving jobs or something or drive a car but that went down because of the because the, the, the price of driving lessons and whatever else but yeah and of course again you know you, you learned it because it would come into play then as well because uh, you have to um you know you, you have to uh, abide by particular criteria yeah, particular yeah. curricula that's in there you know you have to be able to to read the the highway code read signs as well mm, yeah. uh, there's nothing really in place that i'm aware of that would help people like yourself uh to learn to drive with those those barriers yeah definitely yeah. uh obviously you wouldn't drive with these barriers because then you'd run into them <laughs> that was your car so yeah. play on yeah. um <laughs> But and that's an, again something else that I think that, that needs to be brought to the fore that people should be given the support to be able to do the things that other people do because by not giving them that you're actually discriminating against them yeah aren't you really well yeah yeah I mean um, I think it's a shame that people can't do things I mean for me I didn't get the grade I needed for the maths for the course I wanted to do and that was just one subject I got the grades for the others, but not that one subject, and I couldn't go to college full time to be able to do what I wanted to do. And I had no idea what I was going to do after that. I was totally lost. Yeah, I mean, that's an area that, that uh, I, I had a discussion once with somebody from college about this, and uh, it was to do with entry levels for people with yeah. learning disability. And I challenged this particular individual, and I said, Well, okay, you're telling me that that's not working for people who've got dyslexia and things like that. Why don't you change your entry? criteria to actually allow them to be able to enter yeah. I said because what you're doing now is you're stopping them getting to where they want to get to all because they can't fit into your box but they were better change it no so many people that wanted to, to become something else and do something else they couldn't because they got stuck at that particular level many people uh, who even wanted to to, to apply mm -hmm. for something you know early on <coughs> to be able yeah. to do something they were denied right away but even because at that point well, yeah, I, I found, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. because I struggled at school now, um, I didn't have the qualifications to get other jobs. So I had to go back to college to get qualifications to be able to apply. It took me two years of doing night classes to be able to apply for an office job. <laughs> two years. Yeah, uh, but one thing that sticks out for me now before we, uh, we are going to have to round off. Um, do, do you ever notice every time the A-levels come up? how the TV portrays it. Yeah. Yeah. What happens? You always go for the successes. Yeah. The cherry pick and the body up at the envelopes. That's the other thing as well. Don't look starting to me because you've actually seen what you've got before you go on TV. Otherwise you wouldn't be on. No. Because it might not be on TV and oh shit I failed. Ah, stop, cut. Get that off, edit it. They do that again and all it does is stigmatises the people around them who actually haven't been able to achieve. Yeah. Now what how horrible is that? There's these, oh look, we've got double A's and we've got whatever else. And then somebody else is up and theirs up. And they maybe struggle with the way the actual thing's set up. And they've got a C or whatever it is, the grade now in, in A levels. So even with that, you know, it's success, success, top of the league table, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, when you think about it, I don't know if how you remember, Nigel, but if you couldn't get into college even, what did you have? There was nothing. No, there wasn't. There was no options. No, but they created things like job clubs and stuff like oh, that, yeah. you know, but it, it, in order to hold down a job, unless you were going to be digging a hole all day, yeah. you had to have a certain amount of literacy and you ever see. That's the way it was, you know, even filling an application form out could be a nightmare for some people. Because there was no support there. Yeah. Uh, and these job groups were supposed to help them with the CV and all the rest of it. Um, but it, it, it's got to be, it, the person's got to be empowered to learn their way. And you've got to learn from them as well. And then you move forward. I mean, I, I like to think that, that Nigel's been a, a massive success in the input that I've given him over the years. Because it's helped him to do a lot of things he wouldn't normally have done. Yeah. You know, and, and it'd be nice over the, the coming months to be able to get that story out there, Nigel. Yeah. Do you think? Yes. I mean, even doing jigsaws, you know, I mean, Nigel's obviously a, a, um, a, an excellent jigsawist, if that's the right uh, term to use. Doing jigsaws isn't easy. Now, you struggle through school with your, with your unit stuff and that, and your yeah. literacy and numeracy. You get that jigsaw and you compile that within next to no time. 
Yeah. Now that takes skill. Now if you go back in time and, and, and you know learning styles were actually used, right, you're very kinetic. So from here to there, you're able to create something. You're the same with your yeah. artwork as well. Yeah. Now those are skills that are massive and they're transferable as well. Yeah, it's a visual thing, isn't it? It's a yeah. visual way of uh, learning and doing. Um, and it is, it is something that's not really looked at its skill at all. So let's, let's look at those abilities and then look at these A-levels. Yeah. Let's change the way that you do these things because not everybody fits into the same box. But I'm on my uh, soap box now, so <laughs> I'm going to have to round off. So anybody's got any comments, as I've said before there, uh, if they're not nice comments, you can feck off. <laughs> if they're good comments, then we're more than happy to, uh, to read them. But I would be interested in, you know, what you think about our journey to get this out on Nigel's Facebook page. What it's really like to live your life with a learning disability, any kind of complex need, uh, and the kind of things you do to get through life as well. So, is that a wrap? That's a wrap. Thank you very much. That was good, that I